Good day, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to our eighth, eighth installment of, of these free lunch and learn webinars that my team and I are, are hosting here for the world, uh, essentially. Um, these open online webinars uh, do make their way to our YouTube channel. So this will be a shareable video that you can share after the lunch hour today. Um, and then of course, uh, it will be uploaded to our LPC podcast as well. Uh, so thank you all for taking the time to be here today. Um, today's topic uh, for learning is around Indigenous terminology. And I had it in my heart and in my mind to host a workshop on, on terminology because in social media posts, in meetings, in emails to myself and my team, you know, I'm hearing some um, uh, um, some use of terminology where I think that we just need a little bit more room and, and time to kind of um, discuss them. Um, what I will be transparent in is that, you know, by no means am I an expert in terminology, but there are some promising practices for using culturally safer terminology when you're writing about Indigenous people and when you're talking about uh, the Indigenous context, um, which is, you know, in a time of truth and reconciliation, it's the context that we are all currently working in. Uh, so I'm hoping to uh, share with you about 30 minutes worth of content. And then what I'll do is I'll open up the floor for uh, the Q&A uh, portion. Um, so you will be able to ask me any questions off the uh, top of your heart and mind. Uh, there's no such thing as a silly question when it comes to terminology. Uh, my promise to you is, is um, I might not have the answer, um, but if I don't have the answer, I will come back um, and and uh, find the answer to bring, bring back to, to you. Um, so that's uh, our intention for today. Why don't we go ahead and get started? And then I will keep my eye on the uh, Q&A function of this webinar too. Um, one second here, bear with me one second as I share my screen. So the terminology that I'm sharing with you today really is primarily, not primarily, it is totally in the context of Canada and how we use terminology here. Um, you will know or find that terminology really depends on the context in which we are using it. So in the United States, completely different terminology as it will change in other parts of the world as well. Just opening up the Q and A function here. Okay, so let's just dive right into it. Uh, what is the difference between Aboriginal and Indigenous? So one of the things, and it's a question that comes up often, folks are asking me, you know, is it Indigenous or is it Aboriginal? What is the difference? So by definition, in the Canadian context, both Aboriginal and Indigenous are um, umbrella terms to describe in, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Uh, so I say that it's an umbrella term, um, uh, kind of including and encompassing uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. So both are still culturally safe to use. Um, we are in this weird phase in Canada where we are starting to phase out the term Aboriginal. I hear it used less and less. Um, and there are several reasons for this, this uh, phase that we're in. Number one, Aboriginal is an imposed upon term by the federal government to talk about First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Um, number two, um, I don't know if you're a nerd for words like, like I am, but um, Aboriginal has a really weird Latin prefix, A-B, ab, to talk about something that is not. So, you know, how do we talk about something that's not normal? We call it abnormal. So that didn't sit well with a lot of Indigenous leaders uh, once upon a time. So there's been more of this gravitation and pull towards Indigenous as an inclusive term to talk about First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Um, number one, to have our rights recognized through uh, international law, through, through the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which has, has come into act and legislation here in BC 
And then of course, to I, the, I look at this as uh, another way of acting in unity and solidarity with other indigenous countries and cultures across the entire planet. Um, also heavily impacted by colonialism in their own lands and territories and countries. Uh, First Nations is a term that eventually replaced the term Indian in the 1970s. First Nations peoples are land-based nations uh, that trace their heritage all the way back to, you know, their traditional territory. Uh, so that's me. I identify as uh, First Nations coming from Keitsi, uh First Nation. Now, here in Canada, there are well over 630 different First Nations groups in Canada alone. Um, and that's not including the Métis and the Inuit. So more than 630 different First Nations communities, all with their own unique languages, cultural practices, uh, spiritual practices, um, and, and language is a big one too. The vast majority of those First Nations groups will be here in British Columbia, um, as are most of the Indigenous languages in Canada. They're actually here in, in BC. And my hunch for that is it's actually because of our geography. If you look at the mountainous ranges that we have here in BC, they're kind of like these natural um, dividers between um, First Nations communities. Um, so there's a huge diversity even among First Nations people. So what happens here in Canada or here in Keitsi is going to look a lot different than what happens in uh, Sayot, uh, First Nation Territory, or Haida Gwaii, uh, First Nation Territory. Uh, so we're not one big homogenous First Nations group. We're made up of several, several hundred. Uh, from Ellie in the chat box, um, how many First Nations here in British Columbia? Uh, more than 200. Um, so First Nations Health Authority uh, has 203 First Nations, recognized First Nations communities right here in, in BC. Um, so a huge concentration. And the reason for that, again, is, is because of our, our geography, our mountainous uh, region. The Métis are made up of the descendants of Indigenous women and Euro settler men. Uh, the Métis are a distinct Indigenous nation with their own history, culture, languages, and territories with deep historical roots in the three prairie provinces. A common misconception with the word Métis is that a lot of people think it just means you have a First Nations mom or dad and a European mom or dad. That does not make a First Nations person, <laughs> um, or um, that does not make a Métis person, sorry. Uh, for example, um, my daughter, who is leaving right now, <laughs> um, is half First Nations from my lineage, and half English, Scottish, and Irish ancestry on her mother's side. Uh, so that does not make my daughter Métis, that still makes her a First Nations um, person. To actually trace your heritage as a Métis person, you have to trace your ancestry all the way to, you know, those uh, traditional territories, those families that founded the uh, Métis nation um, in the Red River area in Eastern Canada. The Inuit live, live in communities across the Inuvialuit settlement region in the Northwest Territories, Northern Quebec, and Northern Labrador. The Inuit called this vast region Nunugat. Um, a little bit of a trick uh, for referencing or writing or talking about Inuit um, is the word Inuit translated in their language means the people. Uh, so when you're writing or talking about Inuit, you don't have to say Inuit people, because that would kind of be like saying people, people. Uh, so there's a fun fact for uh, you all. Um, from Jennifer West, I heard it was 298 uh, nations. So there are going to be some discrepancies in who, how we are identifying different First Nations groups in British Columbia. And that's because of this little thing called colonialism. <laughs> Um, Canada had forced um, uh, First Nations communities into groups, and then some groups uh, over time have recognized that they are actually two groups who were forced into one. And so um, they have gone through their own stages in their own reclamation that uh, uh, achieving their own independence, um, so becoming more so that's why I say I always follow First Nations health authorities uh, definition of how many First Nations communities 
there are in there because it's a less colonial way of, of looking at uh, First Nations groups. Um, so this is kind of how I use uh, it as, as a picture. Um, indigenous and Aboriginal, both still culturally safe to use. Um, I use both um, interchangeably. Um, I know a lot of Métis relatives, Métis colleagues um, do have a preference for the word Aboriginal um, because of the way that they are reflected, the Métis are reflected in some of the latest constitutional and legislative um, literature that is out there. So I do use Aboriginal and Indigenous um, interchangeably out of respect for uh, many Métis leaders who gravitate to the words at, towards the word uh, Aboriginal. Um, and then of course, they're both also talking about First Nations, Métis and Inuit. Now, what I will say is that it, it is important to know that even the term Aboriginal, Indigenous, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, these are all still English terms and they are there in also colonial terms. Um, so, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, they're like, Len, what did you call yourself before colonization? And I'm like, human being. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, true to myself as a, as a Katsi and a Coast Salish person. Um, traditionally speaking, how we identified ourselves was human beings of the land. Uh, Holmuch is in, in my language, human being of the land. Or um, if you've ever heard of Stolo, Stolo means uh, people of the river. So our identity is, is definitely tied into the land. Um, but when ever you can to be very distinct about the language that you're using. So if you're working with Keatsy, then you know you just uh, use that term Keatsy. You don't necessarily have to use the term um, indigenous. Um, so here are some uh, guidelines I offer people when using uh, indigenous terminology. So please do you know follow people's uh, lead. lead. Um, in how they choose to identify. So, you know, if you're working with an elder and they call themselves an Indian, well, then they identify as an Indian. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if they choose to identify as native, then please follow their suit. Um, some Métis leaders might really only encourage you to use the term Aboriginal when you're working with them. So then follow their suit. Uh, so when in doubt, follow the person and how they choose to be identified, kind of like gender pronouns. Um, do capitalize the I in indigenous, just the way you would capitalize the C in Canada. What we capitalize is what we pay respect uh, to. Um, so please do capitalize the I in indigenous. Sadly, <laughs> um, I live by, you know, Microsoft Word documents that highlight the little red underline when you have a grammar or a spelling um, issue. Um, Microsoft team, Microsoft Word, and your emails will not pick that up as a spelling error. So you do have to train yourself to always capitalize the I in Indigenous. Um, do pluralize Indigenous people to Indigenous peoples. Um, when you pluralize people to peoples, um, you're reflecting the vast diversity of Indigenous people, uh, peoples. Um, you know, we're not one big homogenous group. We are, you know, very, very diverse with hundreds, if not more than a thousand different um, groups within that umbrella of indigeneity. Uh, so please per, uh, uh, pluralize people to peoples. Okay, now some don'ts. <laughs> um, please avoid using possessive terminology in your writing or talking about indigenous people. Um, possessive terminology looks like when we say words like our indigenous partners, our indigenous students, our indigenous communities. When you use possessive terminology like ours, you put the institution up here and indigenous peoples down here. And cultural safety is all about addressing power imbalances inherent in our Western colonial systems. So when you avoid that uh, possessive terminology, you're kind of um, addressing that power dynamic. The same thing for Canada. You know, people say Canada's First Nations people, Canada's Indigenous people. You know, we do not belong to Canada. We are far much older than the concept of Canada. 
Uh, so I always say, watch out for that pitfall of possessive terminology. Um, now I know somebody's thinking this, <laughs> how do you uh, uh, avoid the possessive pitfall? Um, and it's easy, um, you just reverse the word order. So instead of saying our indigenous patients or our indigenous students, you know, just say indigenous students who we work with, indigenous patients that we take care of. Um, and instead of Canada's indigenous people, you say indigenous peoples in Canada. Uh, so you reverse the word order and you skip that pitfall. Um, do avoid the term um, native, uh, the same for Indian. Um, native is a casual term. It's too casual in my mind. And with my cultural safety hat on, it's problematic in, in it's casual and it's being too casual. You will hear us use the term native all the time. <laughs> we identify as native. If we, you know, see somebody or meet somebody who we spec suspect to be native, we'll be like, Are you native? <laughs> Where are you from? Um, we can do that. So I say, if you're in the club, it's totally okay. If you're not in the club, I do not invite you to use that language because it can be problematic for your uh, cultural safety encounters later on down the road. Um, and the same for Indian. Indian is still used today. Um, I mostly hear the term Indian uh, by elders, um, uh, older um, First Nations people in um, communities today. And the reason for that is, you know, they, the change happened in the 1970s. Um, so that wasn't that long ago. And they probably grew up identifying themselves as an Indian under the Indian Act with Indian status cards and probably residing within an Indian band. So in their formative years, it just became a part of their identity that that's how they choose is the term Indian. Uh, I don't recommend that anybody use the term Indian today unless you happen to be uh, somebody who identifies as an Indian coming from India. Um, so um, if you use the term Indian, it's probably in the context of Indian status cards, um, the Indian Act, or if you work with a First Nation that does solidify and, and confirm that they choose to be called an Indian band. Musqueam is a great example. Musqueam First Nation does not call themselves Musqueam First Nation. They call themselves Musqueam Indian Band. So follow their suit. So those are my do's and don'ts for culturally safer terminology. I'm just gonna turn my attention to the chat box here. Um, Jess, should we capitalize peoples when we say indigenous peoples? Good question. I've seen both. I mean, um, I think it's totally safe to do so. Um, as you know, there are, there's this little thing called language policing that happens in, in social justice circles. Um, I don't think you'll get in trouble for not capitalizing the P. You will for not capitalizing, capitalizing the I, though. Um, so as a safety net, go ahead and capitalize it. But I use, I see, I think myself, I go interchangeable. Sometimes I capitalize the P, sometimes I don't. How about indigenous peoples of Turtle Island? Oh, Carlos, I like that. Yes, of course, I think that's wonderful. And a very less colonial way of saying North America. Um, yes, so um, the question in the chat box is, when it comes to written policy and organizations, some of these policies are termed equity, diversity, and inclusivity. Um, I've heard you speak about developing indigenous specific language policies. Yes, so EDI work, and I know all of your organizations, all of your organizations are working on equity, diversity, and inclusivity because those are deemed to be, you know, more racialized uh, initiatives, you know, um, to help increase diversity and inclusivity of people with diverse abilities and people of color, um, or what I like to call the global majority. <laughs> um, equity, diversity, and inclusivity is not the same thing as cultural safety, reconciliation, or decolonization. Um, and they, they need to be distinct. They need to be their own separate initiatives in organizations because they have different objectives. They have different goals. Um, EDI work, equity, diversity, and inclusivity um, operationalizes 
and normalizes colonialism in our workplace. Cultural safety and reconciliation is meant to disrupt, deconstruct, and dismantle colonial and oppressive um, mechanisms in institutions today. Um, and I'm not a fan of the word include, especially when you have indigenous in, in the indigenous context, I'm not a fan of the word include um, because to include somebody is to imply that you are not at home. Uh, to include somebody is to imply that, you know, it's not your space. And in reconciliation, in cultural safety, you know, these are our lands and territories. So you can't include us on our own lands and territories because it's our, it's our house, it's our home. So I'm not a fan of the word inclusion, indigenous inclusion. Um, and yes, absolutely, two very distinct things. And I'm not anti-EDI. <laughs> I know there's EDI folks on this call here. I'm not anti-EDI, um, but I am uh, uh, an advocate that those two are two very different contexts, two very different strategic initiatives for organizations today. Um, I'm very much for EDI work, but they cannot be un put under the same umbrella. Um, it becomes, I'm just gonna be transparent with you, it becomes tokenistic or very objective tick boxy um, initiatives when we add indigenous, indigeneity, anything indigenous into that container of EDI work. So a big part of our work is separating those, those two. Uh, can we get a copy of the do's and don'ts slide to share amongst peers? Absolutely, you will definitely have access to this. Uh, I can also screenshot this and share this as a uh, social media post. Um, from Alex, we are currently working on an OCP update and the term first peoples is being used. What are your thoughts on that approach? Um, so this is a really good question. Uh, the term first peoples is very close to uh, first nations um, and there is a misconception in the public and among indigenous peoples that when you're using the term first peoples, you're you, it's really reinforcing of a first nations uh, approach, uh, a first nations focus. I don't, I know that's not the intention with the word first peoples. Um, it's another way of saying indigenous and Aboriginal, but it's been my experience that uh, Métis uh, colleagues of mine, Inuit colleagues of mine have said, when you use the term first peoples, it really sounds like you're being First Nations specific, which could be excluding Métis and Inuit. So I think First Peoples is fine to use if you're working just in the First Nations context, um, but do know that there's some potential there that if it's meant to be inclusive of Métis and Inuit, then it can come across as being exclusive uh, because of the misconception with the word First Peoples and how close it is to First Nations, just being honest. Um, Yeah, is there a safe and respectful way to ask if not provided um, what an individual categorizes themselves or how they identify, right? So I think that's really good. I think that it's okay to ask for permission if the time, the context, and the climate is right for you. Um, that if you hear them using words interchangeably like First Nations, Indian, Native, I think it's okay to ask for, for clarity. I would just be very, I would ask for permission, say, can I ask you a weird question? Um, it feels awkward for me to ask it, but I'm, is it okay if I ask you a question around uh, terminology? And they will probably say yes. If they're not in the mentality or the bandwidth to uh, uh, lean in with responding to a question, then they're gonna deny. <laughs> um, so ask for permission, be transparent and just say, you know, I've heard you use a couple of different terms. Or, you know, I would like to address you appropriately, you know, can I ask how you like to, how you choose to identify? Um, just like gender pronouns, um, you can ask people on how they choose to identify within their gender pronouns. Okay, um, carrying on, and then I'm going to turn back to uh, the chat box. Um, is it possible to see other questions or can we get a copy of that? Yeah, I don't even know. Let me see if I can make them public here. Allow anonymous questions. Okay. You can also vote on um, questions in the chat box now too. Look at me figuring out stuff <laughs> uh, in front of the masses here. Okay. Um, so I also encourage you, if you are a nerd for words and you want to look up more culturally safer uses of terminology, 
do Google distinctions-based approach for uh, the BC context. And this is applicable to Canada as well. Um, but wherever you possibly can, if you work heavily in the Indigenous context, do check out uh, distinctions-based approach. The distinctions-based approach is uh, um, a, a means of really just being very clear and explicit with which uh, nation, which group um, that is Indigenous that you're talking about. Um, so this can look like, uh, what do we have here? Um, so we're using language that is conducted in a manner that acknowledges the specific rights, interests, priorities, and concerns of each while respecting and acknowledging these distinct peoples with unique cultures, histories, rights, and laws and governments. So if you're working in the context of just working with First Nations people, then you don't need to use the word Aboriginal or Indigenous um, because your, your mandate or your work or maybe your proximity is only with indig Indigenous people. Um, if your mandate is to work with all Indigenous people, then I would use Indigenous peoples. So you're being distinct with your term uh, terminology choice. And if your organization is just working with one nation, like Musqueam First Nation, and that's it, then you would just use Musqueam First Nation and not Indigenous or Aboriginal, because you're being very distinct um, in your language use. Um, colonialism is a good one to understand too. I mean, colonialism is a system of social, economic, political, and cultural uh, relations characterized by an imposition of foreign authority, destruction of indigenous rights and political structures. And of course, the whole goal, the objective and the aim of colonialism is economic exploitation where resources are extracted. And then of course they're sent off to um, the mother country. Decolonization. And so decolonization one is, is a good word to talk about because it is important to know there's no one universal definition for the word decolonization. Um, if I have indigenous, and I know I have indigenous friends and colleagues on the line here, you know, uh, a lot of Indigenous people say that decolonization is about land back. Absolutely, decolonization is land back. Um, some Indigenous people say uh, decolonization is about language back. I'm like, yes, absolutely. That's very much decolonization. And, you know, non-Indigenous settlers who are allies, you know, I love their definitions of decolonization because they say it's disrupting or disempowering colonial and oppressive systems and recentering um, indigenous ways of being and doing and knowing and leaders. Um, so those are all wonderful definitions. Um, I have created my own definition for decolonization. Um, it's something that you can do when you get your master's degree. Um, when I was studying at, at Simon Fraser University for my master's degree, my whole focus for two and a half years of study was decolonizing colonial institutions like education. And so I've read more than 50, five, zero different definitions for the word decolonize. Uh, so my definition with all my audacity <laughs> is I define decolonization as a process. It's a process of dismantling, deconstructing and disrupting colonial and cultural barriers that separate us, divide us, suppress us and quite often oppress indigenous peoples and other equity seeking um, communities. Common misconception is that only Indigenous people will benefit from decolonization work. All people benefit from the good work of, of decolonization. Uh, indigenization, I also hear this one being used a lot too, and you will hear the word indigenize in um, the realm of education. I, so if you work in colleges, universities, or the public K-12 system, I know indigenization is a word that you hear uh, being spoken about quite often. Indigenization and decolonization are not the same things. Um, indigenization, and this is coming from Indigenous Corporate Training Canada, um, Bob Joseph's uh, website. Um, I've taken his definition of indigenization, where he defines it as a process of embedding intertwining indigenous peoples, ways of being, ways of doing, and values into the infrastructure of an organization. 
Um, another definition I love of indigenizing is to bring under indigenous control and aligned within natural law. That's my favorite definition of indigenization. Um, so Mary Simons, uh, the governor general of Canada who is of Inuit ancestry, this is a beautiful example of both decolonization and indigenization. It's, it's you know, embedding, um, hardwiring indigenous representation into one of our most colonial institutions. So I would say that's an example of indigenize. Reconciliation, on the other hand, is a process of um, uh, ongoing process of establishing and maintaining respectful relationships uh, with Indigenous people. A lot of people think that reconciliation is a government objective, tick boxy to do thing. Uh, a lot of people think that reconciliation is just about the calls to action. Um, and I say that's not just about the calls to action, it's not just a political endeavor. Um, in this country, if you look at the core of the word reconciliation or to reconcile, you know, um, it's a process of making two people or groups of people friendly again <laughs> uh, after they have argued seriously or fought and kept apart from each other or a situation in which this happens, you know, so you can reconcile with your spouse, you can reconcile with your friend after you've fought um, and so that's why I like to use reconciliation as a very overarching systemic endeavor, societal change in Canada, but it also can play out down on this singular level where settlers um, who are not Indigenous um, explore their own opportunities for everyday acts of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. My dad likes to define reconciliation as a bridge, building a bridge on one side of the river are indigenous peoples and on the other side of the river are non-indigenous Canadians, settlers and allies. And he defines reconciliation as, as bridge building between these two different worlds so that we can meet each other and support one another and work together uh, for the first time ever in this country. Um, so I love that analogy of reconciliation. Last couple of slides here, I promise, and then I'm gonna open up the floor to your uh, good questions. Uh, so let's talk about uh, Indian, Indian status and the Indian Act. So the term Indian was used until the 1970s, as I've mentioned, it can be, and very much is a contentious term, um, uh, which can be derogatory in, in many senses. But like I said, many elders and sometimes, you know, young Indigenous people or First Nations people will identify as, as being Indians. And many communities still identify as, as Indian bands as, as well. And I find that to be very common in the North and common in the interior, where you know, um, First Nations communities still identify as uh, uh, Indians, Indian bands. Uh, but it is still used legally in Canada. We have the Indian status cards, we have the Indian Act, um, and if you've ever seen your GPS when you're driving past a reserve, uh, it will say India Band or Indian Reserve. Um, and if you hear a abbreviated IR, um, like KTIR1, KTIR2, IR just means Indian Reserve. So Indian status is federally uh, federal identification that confirms you are registered under the Indian Act. Now, I said that there are more than 600 um, First Nations groups. Every First Nations group will have a number um, uh, within the Indian Act. So for example, um, Katsi, I come from Katsi, Katsi carries a number um, and every First Nations community will have its own number uh, being registered under the Indian Act. The Indian Act is a Canadian federal law that governs in matters pertaining to Indian status, bans, and Indian reserves. Throughout history, it has been highly invasive and paternalistic as it authorizes the Canadian federal government to regulate and administer in the affairs and day-to-day -day, day -day lives of registered Indians and reserve communities. So I would argue that the Indian Act is the most racist piece of legislation that exists on the planet today. And that's not in some war-torn country or developing country. 
it's in our country, the most racist piece of legislation that exists today. Um, so it's highly oppressive. Um, and, and, you know, with all due respect for, you know, people who are arriving into Canada, even if the refugees, a refugee coming to Canada will have more rights and freedoms than indigenous people, First Nations people who carry status cards um, because of the Indian Act and it's and the legislation that that's there. Um, and I don't say that, I just say that as, as a framing of how oppressive uh, that document really is. Now I know somebody's thinking this, well, how do we get rid of the Indian Act? <laughs> um, I teach this um, at Kwantlen University and all my students, right, when we learn about the Indian Act, uh, a good um, uh, resource or a good book, if you're looking for a book to read, is 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. Um, great, great read to get caught up on, on that. You can even YouTube it and really great uh, dialogues and resources will come up. Um, but my students are always like, how do we get rid of this Indian Act? If it's the most racist piece of legislation on the planet today, how do we get rid of it? And I love Bob Joseph's response to how we can retire the Indian Act because it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Just being transparent with you all. Um, Bob Joseph says that we can retire the Indian Act when every First Nations community who's currently under the Indian Act is seen as a sovereign country, is seen as its own sovereign nation. So Casey, Kwantlen, Musqueam, tsleil Squamish, all of our nations would be seen as their little countries with their own laws and taxation and justice systems. You know, that's when we can get rid of the Indian Act because right now too much is just being scaffolded in it that, that is, is keeping a lot of communities going. So it's a big, big nightmare, <laughs> big nightmare file in this reconciliation uh, uh, journey. So Coast Salish, and there are many groups uh, that I'm not gonna mention um, here today. You'll have to do your own digging if you are not in the lower mainland of British Columbia. If you are in the Lower Mainland, you will also hear Coast Salish being brought up. Coast Salish is also an umbrella term to talk about many different subcultural groups that are First Nations. So you, you hear me in my introduction as being a Coast Salish person coming from KT First Nation. I identify as a Coast Salish person so that when I'm introducing myself, my Eastern uh, Indigenous friends and colleagues or my Northern indigenous friends and colleagues will know which kind of region of Turtle Island I'm coming from. Because if I say I'm from KT First Nation, I'm not taking it for granted that they know exactly where that is. So I use Coast Salish and my own introduction to let people know which place of Turtle Island I am, I'm uh, hailing from, um, essentially. It's a way to position myself culturally um, out there in, in the world. So um, I often get this question, you know, uh, I've even actually heard some contentious uh, arguments around the term settler. Um, a lot of people think that settler has to do with race or ethnicity. Settler has nothing to do with race or ethnicity. Um, when we use or hear the term settler for describing a non-Indigenous person, it's really just meant to, you know, um, self-identify yourself as that, a non-Indigenous person. Your ancestry, your ancestors, your laws, and your stories, and your identity are not here in this part of the world. They come from a different place. So it's more about self-positioning yourself. It's more about um, describing yourself in terms of being a, a relation than it is about being white or being Eurocentric or coming from a European uh, community. Um, you know, you can be in a settler from China. You could be a settler from uh, Brazil. You could be a settler from uh, Australia. You could be a settler from India. You know, settler is just a really a way to position yourself as a non-Indigenous person. And the more you are on your learning journey, I'm, and you've heard me describe this at the last webinar, I'm always in encouraging settlers to position themselves when they're doing their introductions, especially if Indigenous peoples are in a space. Because the more you are working in the Indigenous context, 
right? You're, you're mobilizing cultural safety. You are mobilizing reconciliation, decolonization, indigenization. The more you're in that learning journey, the more <laughs> indigenous people are gonna be seeing your language and your behavior. And they're gonna be wondering who you are and where you're coming from. <laughs> Elders do that to me all the time. Elders will hear allies who have been on their learning journey for a long time and sound like they sound really great and like they know what they're doing and they're advocating for indigeneity. And the elders will like lean over to me and they're like, who is that? And I'm like, oh, that's so-and-so. And they're like, well, where are they from? Thinking that they're indigenous. So I say, don't leave elders guessing. Don't leave indigenous people in space guessing. You know, if you're not indigenous, don't be afraid to say I'm a non-indigenous or I'm a settler of English ancestry, Indian ancestry, you know, um, and those are the best introductions. I call those introducing yourself in your good way, but it has nothing to do with your culture. It's a way to position yourself as not, you're not indigenous and your ancestors are not from these lands and territories. Oh, that was it. Okay, there are like 62 <laughs> questions in the Q and A uh, uh, there. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I will turn my attention to all of those good questions um, that, that you have. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Was that helpful? Let me know. <laughs> Um, what do you suggest as a better way to uh, express inclusion when expressing support for Indigenous leadership in decision-making? Oh, I love that. Um, just being, and you have to do your own creative uh, word smithing on getting around the word include. Um, so if you're wanting to include uh, Indigenous leadership in decision-making, um, I would say we need, we need to consult with Indigenous leadership here we need to um, uh, seek the guidance and the wisdom of indigenous leaders. You know, so there's all these different ways that you just get tricky with, with the language. I just, and it's, I know I shared that feeling with many other indigenous colleagues of mine, academic colleagues who are just really not fans of, of the word include. So consult, seek the guidance and wisdom, seek the authority, seek the representation of indigenous leaders. You know, there's all these ways to just get around that, that include, um, pitfall. Um, can you discuss the term unseated and uninvited guest that we hear in introductions and territorial acknowledgements? Yeah, absolutely. So the term unseated literally means never surrendered. Um, there was no transaction for the land that Canada um, has become so wealthy off of. So when you use the term uh, unseated, you are implying that you are on stolen lands, essentially. And I encourage folks to use the term unseated all the time. Um, the, some of the greatest allies will say that they are calling in from the stolen and occupied uh, lands and territories of, of so-and-so because they're just being transparent and calling it what it is, that they're stolen lands. They were never ceded, they were never surrendered. Um, when people say uninvited guest, it means that no, there was no uh, invitation. So you are occupying indigenous lands and territories. So I encourage folks to use that type of language because again, you are really positioning yourself in your introduction and in your territorial acknowledgement. So when you hear those, um, when you hear non-indigenous people using those terms, um, they are <laughs> following what they're learning, right? They're practicing what they're they're speaking and they're just positioning themselves and positioning themselves on the relationship to the territory that where they live, where they work and where they play are on stolen lands. So that's what unseated means and what uninvited um, guest means. I don't know how Inuit refer to their territories but they don't use the term Turtle Island. It's being suggested that it's not an inclusive term. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to terminology, there's never really going to be a perfect way, um, just like how you cannot guarantee safety for working with Indigenous peoples, right? Safety is determined by the person who you are working with. So I can't guarantee you that you're always going to get it right. I don't always get it right. Uh, like I said, you know, we do have language monitoring or language policing that happens in our communities. And I don't ever want to police in, uh, people's language, but wherever I can, I like to create spaces like this where it's like, oh, I didn't know that. 
oh, I didn't know that. And then we could change our language. Language is no small thing. <laughs> language constructs our thoughts, our thoughts construct our beliefs, and our beliefs inform how we will treat one another as, as human being. So I think that's an important one to take away, um, that the Inuit you know, actually do not refer to North America as, as Turtle Island. I use Turtle Island in my terminology word bank to have less colonial way of describing North America. So if you use the term Turtle Island um, in your vocabulary, you can do so moving forward now, knowing that it might not include the representation or orientation of how Inuit have their relationship with their land and territory. Uh, but it can be just a less colonial way of saying North America. Will this recording be available? Absolutely. Um, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and then I will share it uh, publicly on my social media channels as soon as it's live and, and out there. Our as a word in English to be inclusive, positive, but in the indigenous language, it's an ownership word. This is challenging to overcome from our communication teaching. It is so hard and I'm just gonna be transparent with you because <clears throat> I can. Um, and you all know this if you sat in on previous sessions of mine, <laughs> um, transparency is my corporate superpower. Uh, I can't turn it off. Um, I'm just gonna be transparent with you. It's hard for us too, as indigenous people, as indigenous leaders. I use the term our all the time. And actually many chiefs, leaders, elders, they say our all the time, our people is what they will say. Our nations, our communities, our children, our elders, you know, our is a very, is, is a very solidarity and unity type of, of language use, but it comes up more often than not. And if you work in healthcare or education, I hear this being used a lot. And then they'll, they'll have one of my sessions, right? And they're like, oh yeah, sorry, I possessive, possessive term, right, Len? And I'm like, yeah, it's all right, it's okay, right? We need to be forgiving in our language and word choice. And that's why I said it's cultural safer terminology, but it's not gonna be 100% safe uh, terminology. Um, we gotta leave room for error and learning from our errors, essentially. Where does cultural safety apply in terms of using terminology like invasive species? Um, I think de destructive introduced species is more precise and less loaded. Yeah, and, and um, I would agree. Uh, destructive introduced species is definitely. Um, I hear this as a very common term in indigenous communities, um, uh, especially around plants plants and animals who are colonizing spaces uh, of traditional lands and territories. Uh, but I like what you've offered here. It is more precise and less loaded. So thank you for that. That's a new one for me. Uh, from Chloe, is it appropriate for organizations to say EDID, E-D-I-D? <laughs> meaning equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization? Or should reconciliation and decolonization be isolated entirely given its importance? Uh, is this where tokenism, tokenism comes in? Yeah, so I look at if your EDI work is including encompassing reconciliation, decolonization, indigenization, I'm gonna say that's gonna put your organization at risk for tokenizing the initiative because they're not the same thing. Uh, EDI work in all of my, my learning, it's great, it's wonderful, we need those things, but cultural safety, reconciliation, decolonization is about change, changing the status quo, challenging the status quo, um, and it will always address oppression and um, how colonial our institutions really are. So then they're not the same thing. Your best practice, your promising practice, we'll be having two distinct initiatives. Um, we're very smart organizations. We're highly intelligent and we're for the most part, well-resourced. We can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. <laughs> um, it's very colonial thinking to say, well, is it this one or that one? That's very black and white thinking, which is colonial thinking. Well, which one's the good one? Which one's the bad one? 
I'm never about, is it this or that, you know, all or nothing thinking. I'm more about why can we not have both? Why can we not have these two initiatives run parallel and scaffold a lot of wonderful work that will come through the organization because of EDI and because of reconciliation? Full transparency, not all organizations, not all teams are as equipped, are as resourced. And so as a default, you know, if your school, if your organization simply cannot, because uh, you, you cannot, you know, create a different initiative, you cannot because you're understaffed, under-resourced, um, then I say to carry out reconciliation, okay, it can go back into that container of EDI. It's not the best, it's not the promising practice, but to keep it going, I'm like, at least it will have some impact. It will have some uh, effect by at least having some place, some platform, some container for it to continue to grow. Um, the promising practice is having them separate, but if for whatever your limitations are, it can be, you know, grandfathered or nurtured by the EDI uh, initiative, but not my go-to, not my go-to. Yeah, Tara in the um, Q&A, ask yourself uh, why you are asking how people identify. Why do you want to know if that person is Indigenous from an Indigenous uh, in attendee? So I think that's really good. I mean, you need to be very intentional with if you are asking the question, how do you choose to identify? That can come across as racist in nature. So you really want to be safe. You really want to be cautious. You really want to be mindful if you're going out there in the world and say, are you First Nations or Indigenous? Are you Aboriginal or Indigenous? How do you identify, right? It can be, uh, uh, can come across as offensive, can come across as insensitive. So you really wanna be gentle. You kind of wanna be in some relationship already with that person. Um, and you just wanna be safe and gentle in, in how you navigate asking the question, how you identify. So when is the right context to use the word decolonization if adding it to the EDI acronym? Which word would best uh, de indigenization, reconciliation, or decolonization? So when you look at EDI work, EDI work is about um, creating inclusivity, uh, diversity, uh, sustainable means of equity and inclusivity and diversity in our corporate Western systems. So in this regard, uh, of we're talking about people, EDI is talking about people. So rather than reconciliation or decolonization, my go-to word would be indigenous cultural safety. Um, that's what I would add into the, into the same line as, as EDI work. Because if you look at the definition of cultural safety, it's addressing those power imbalances inherent in our colonial systems. So that would be my go-to word to include in the same line as EDI work um cultural safety uh because that's what we're really talking about here and again it's change and it's challenging uh the status quo uh that one i think you get a little bit more closer towards uh um again making it people centered the people who are in your organization you can absolutely have a copy of the powerpoint so you can access them on my website at lenpeerconsulting.com they're not up there yet, but I will leave them uh, there for, for folks. And then again, I will release it on my social media. My goodness, look at the time. Okay. Thank you. The BC Distinction of Based Approach Primer document is pretty useful. Thank you for that. What are your thoughts around First Peoples of Learning principles or First Peoples principles of learning uh, and the use of First Peoples? Uh, again, and it's just been shared with me by the Indigenous community, that when we use terms like First Peoples, it can look um, exclusive of Métis and Inuit, um, because it just sounds so similar to First Nations. The term First Peoples is meant to be like Indigenous, it's meant to be Aboriginal, it's meant to be that umbrella term. But when you call it First Peoples, it does have that inclination to be exclusive, excluding uh, not all, not every uh, Indigenous person. Does it exclude them by technicality? It doesn't. But um, that's what happens in the English language. The <laughs> English language is, is, uh, is, is, has its limitations. Um, so something to think about.
Yes, of course. So my Instagram account handle is Len J. Pierre. Give me a follow. I'm on Facebook as well. And that's where I promote all of our, our resources. If you're not on social media, you can go to our website, lenpeerconsulting.com. And the very first box that will pop up is an opportunity to sign up for our, our newsletter. And through our newsletter, we can share our resources um, as well. Can you speak to the difference between colonization and colonization? I think you mean there, uh, Jackie, uh, colonialism. What's the difference between colonialism and colonization? Um, elders have told me or offer, invited me to use the term co colonialism because it's present tense. Um, I think if you use the term colonization, there's this implication that it happened in the past, but there is this very strong uh, way that colonialism is alive and well in our country today. Lots of colonial norms, colonial values that drive our Western world here in Canada. And so it was actually elders, matriarchs, who said, Len, I invite you to use the term colonialism because it's alive and well today. Colonization is kind of like, seems like it's a thing of the past. Um, so I've adopted that into my uh, practice, uh, professional practice, when I, I talk about colonialism. You are most welcome. Uh, just heard you use the term non-Indigenous settlers, as I've heard terms like colonizer, European, any insight into these terms? Um, yeah, I mean, it would be the same thing for, it would be distinctions based. And that's entirely up on you as non-Indigenous peoples, for those of you who are non-Indigenous, you know, how you identify. Do you identify as European or a settler? Or I don't, I very rarely hear the term colonizer as self-identified by people who come from that that background. Um, but I think settler, settler is to me, in my mind, in the realm that I teach cultural safety, really positions yourself basically as a non-Indigenous person. Um, and this is, I always hear this in introductions. Either people say they're non-Indigenous from so-and-so or they're settler from so-and-so and then they say their, their ancestry. Okay, I think I will take um, maybe one, maybe two questions left. You're most welcome, you're most welcome. Okay, these are people saying thank you. Yeah, um, from Kier, um, the term reconciliation assumes that you had a good relationship to begin with and then you're reconciling the relationship but the relationship has it ever been good um no it's quite problematic it's been quite challenging and very oppressive and very violent um so i think that again this is just the the use of the english language um, not all indigenous people like the word reconciliation because how can you ever fully um reconcile um yeah Darren, um, South African apartheid laws were adopted from laws introduced here in Canada. Yeah, um, the apartheid in South Africa that was directly informed by the Indian Act here, um, as were um, you know science experiments on starving Indigenous children. Once upon a time, that was traded out to uh, that science was traded out to Nazi Germany um, with the Jewish encampments that they had there. So not common knowledge for Canadians um, across uh, the country yet. Okay, I will leave you with this resource um, shared by Florence. Uh, another good read for others is Unsettling the Settler Within by Paulettier Regan. Thank you. Okay, that brings us at 60 minutes uh, uh, exactly. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully that was uh, offered some a little bit of peace of mind for all these different terms that that you hear out there in the world. Uh, thank you so much for taking um, the lunch hour to spend with me um, as as you allow me to be a little bit of a guide, a little bit of a mentor on your learning journey. And if you're not signed up on our newsletter or following me on uh, uh, social media, give me a like, give me a follow on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn.
um, or our, our website, uh, our newsletter, and we'll stay in touch. And I will see you at future uh, webinars. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Have a great rest of your day and a great week ahead of you. Aichka. Aichka, see ya.